When did the lameness on the hind leg begin? About three months ago, he, he was in some long grass running around with our other dog, and he yelped. And he was laid down, and I couldn't work out what had happened. And that lasted about a day, and then two weeks ago he did something, and we realised it was the back. He did it again about a week ago, and we realised something wasn't right. All right, well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? He's holding it, toe touching. And you can see the main pad coming up off the ground there. And uh, he's just not bearing weight on it properly. You'll also notice that he's got a very straight hind leg stance. So all of this breed really are being bred more and more for an, an increasingly upright hind leg stance. Um, so what's actually happening in his knee is that um, the femur is now slipping down the slope of the tibia. And that's called a tibial plateau. So the femur is literally slipping down the slope like that. Because almost certainly, I'm going to feel it now, almost certainly the front one of those two ligaments there, the front one of those two ligaments is ruptured. The ligaments are inside the knee. If one runs that way, one runs that way. They're called cruciate ligaments because they cross over. The front one is almost certainly ruptured. Okay, so I'm just holding the knee now. Okay, good. Now, a lot of times this will be, have, been, have been going on for a while. Mm -hmm. So probably five months. Because yeah. three months ago you noticed for the first time. Yeah. And then more recently, okay? And what's happening is that the body, when that ligament begins to fray, it produces scar tissue around the knee, okay? Mm -hmm. And that scar tissue around the knee is called periarticular fibrosis, so it's fibrosis around the knee. So when I grab his knee, it's not ostensibly unstable. So when I grab it, it doesn't obviously move, but I know from the way he's holding his foot that that's exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. So the ligament is fraying and the body's compensating for that. And a lot of people, when they don't feel that shunting forward, they think, oh, it must be okay. Mm -hmm. Not so. So watch what happens here. So there's the kneecap, there's the top of the tibia. Watch what happens when I press the foot. The tibia shunts forward, do you see that? That shouldn't happen. Okay, so that's fine. So when you grab it, all right, buddy, well done. Well done, good boy, good boy. When you grab it and move it about, people think it should be loose. That's not the case sometimes because the body's produced enough scar tissue around there. So what's actually happening here, is that uh, this is the uh, femur, this is the tibia, and these are the two ligaments inside the knee, okay? This ligament here is ruptured. So the femur slipping down the slope like that. And when it slips down the slope, it catches this cartilage there, which is called the meniscus. So it squashes the cartilage here. And then they get what's called a meniscal tear. It's like a golfer with a clicking knee. So you can have a situation where the cartilage inside the knee is torn as well as the ligament. 30% of all the dogs we see have a cartilage tear at the time we see them. Because there was a couple of times where he'd be playing with the other dog or something and he'd give a little yelp. Yeah. We couldn't tell what That'll was be when he happened. jarred it. So the body's compensating all the time for the problem, but he then keeps jarring it. So. Um, the bottom line here is we need to address that. I'm not a fan of replacing the ligament in these large breed dogs with degenerative cruciate rupture because my experience is that over time you may have further issues. So what I try and do is address the knee permanently in terms of the geometry of the knee. I've already said to you the dog's standing upright and the femur is slipping down the slope. So what we're going to do in this instance is we're going to alter the angle of the slope to stop it slipping. So that green line is called a tibial plateau because it's like the plateau of a mountain here. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a curved cut in the top of the tibia and we're going to rock that plateau around so that it ends up perpendicular to the kneecap tendon. When it ends up perpendicular to the kneecap tendon, the knee no longer slips. So when that is at a right angle to the kneecap tendon, this doesn't slip down the hill anymore. Yeah. But in reality, what happens is that the muscle here and the muscle here balances out. 
when this thing is exactly at a right angle. In other words, when we rotate the top of the tibia around to here, this muscle here and this, these muscles here balance out and it doesn't slip anymore. So even though that ligament's gone and it's never coming back, we don't need to replace it because we've balanced the muscles here and the muscles here. The cartilage, if it's torn, we clean that up at the time. If they have a torn cartilage, they get worse arthritis than if they don't have a torn cartilage, but they still do fine most of the time. Very few dogs need a total knee replacement, very few. So the vast majority of dogs with this procedure will go through to the end of their life and be fine. They may get arthritis to the point that they need medication, but that's unlikely. The top of the tibia here is plated in position, so a plate is put on that to hold it together while it heals like a fractured bone, and that takes six weeks to heal. Does There's that plate come out? No. no. We, we, it stays in there forever. There's three major risks. Uh, overall complication rate is in the region of 5-6%. Three major risks. Infection. There's no doubt that a group of large dogs are more susceptible to infection than a group of smaller dogs. But with the newer technology we have here for locking the plate in position, the infection rate has come down. The other thing that's really helped us is to swab every dog in and out to make sure they're not carrying bugs. Because there's three sources of infection, the hospital, the dog itself, or your, your environment. So you do your best, I do my best, and I, we do a good job during the surgery and we use the implants to minimize everything. Um, implant problems are very rare, so infection is the biggest risk. Implant problems are very rare nowadays. We hardly ever see them because they're very robust. Uh, the screws lock in the plate and the plate locks to the bone. The third group of complications are delayed meniscal tear. Let's say there's not a cartilage tear at the time. Let's say it's not torn today. What are the chances that you've got a tear inside that cartilage that becomes apparent later in life? Between 2 and 3 percent. So uh, I did a study where the delayed cartilage tear rate was 2.8 percent overall. So if this dog ever did go lame again on this leg, that was likely the reason why, and you have to go in arthroscopically and clean it up. You go in with the camera and clean it up. So today, what I propose to do is to address this by having a look in the joint, cleaning everything up, doing a cut on the tibia, rotating around, putting a plate on it. Then there's some stitches here to come out at two weeks. Uh, there's no aftercare for you in terms of anything to do with the wound. It's just K dress and lead only walking for six weeks, 10 minutes, four times a day. We'll see you at two weeks. If there's any physio needed, we'll tell you. But most of the time, dogs cope very well with this procedure and the complication rate is very low. The procedure is called a tibial plateau leveling. And because we cut the bone, it's called an osteotomy, so hence the term TPLO, tibial plateau leveling osteotomy. So this dog just sat down and tucked the legs underneath before he plonked down. That's absolutely classic of a dog that has the cruciate brewing on the other side for a dog that is almost certainly going to have the other cruciate rupture in his lifetime. This problem is very, very common in, um, in, the, in these dogs. So it's not uncommon that I would see multiple joints affected, uh, elbows and knees primarily, uh, hips also. People think that the hips are the biggest issue. Um, in, in my experience, it's, it's, it's one third of the issues. Knees are one third of the issues, elbows are one third of the issues. Okay guys, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take him through and then we're going to go to the front desk and, and we'll sort out the insurance bit, okay? Uh, the main manifestation of uh, cruciate disease or rupture of the cruciate ligament, uh, the cranial cruciate ligament in the knee of the large breed dog is partial weight bearing on the leg, so they don't bear full weight on their main pad. They just hold it toe touching like that. The clinical examination shows us that the tibia here is moving forwards on the femur. You can see it snap forwards like that, which is called cranial tibial thrust. 
When you grab the top of the tibia and you grab the bottom of the femur and you rock it like that, it also moves abnormally. That's called cranial drawer. So there's two cruciate ligaments. One runs forwards, one runs backwards. This one here is ruptured in this dog. And as a result, the tibia pops forwards instead of staying put and there's not full weight bearing on the leg. So today we're going to do an operation on this dog and uh, we're going to uh, sort that out. Let's go.